So welcome to the webinar, the 17th webinar of ERN Gardhart. Uh, there's still people coming in. Uh, very welcome, of course. And uh, today we have a nice program about ARVC in children. And we will start with uh, Dr. Judith Groeneweg. She is a, a cardiologist in the Utrecht Medical Center. And uh, Uther, uh, um, Judith, may I give you the word and, and uh, you can start your presentation, I think. Yep. Thank you so much for the uh, invitation. Uh, let me share my screen. So I hope this uh, works for all of you. Um, so thanks again, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, also um, share my happiness to, to present uh, together with uh, Dominic Abrams uh, on pediatric uh, ARVC, uh, since it's a very morning, early morning hour uh, for him. Um, and uh, the theme of the webinar uh, today is uh, pediatric ARVC, and I will uh, dive into the diagnosis and uh, family screening part of it. And um, I'm not sure if I can see any hands or um, uh, so please feel free to interrupt me uh, when you have questions. And you can also use the chat uh, if you like to. Yeah, okay. Um, so this will be the outline uh, for today. Uh, after the introduction, I will share a case with you, um, which will lead us to the uh, diagnosis uh, of ARVC in children. Uh, and I will uh, end the presentation with uh, some notes on uh, individualized family screening. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or uh, ARVC, or ARVDC, or ACM, uh, is, uh, as you probably all know, an inherited cardiomyopathy, um, in which uh, a genetic uh, causal variant is found in uh, approximately two-thirds of cases. Um, mostly in desmosomal genes, and in the Netherlands, uh, it's mostly uh, PKP2 mutations. And it was uh, once regarded as a disease uh, that was most relevant to young adults, uh, but the past decade uh, also witnessed a, a growing group of children with ARVC, uh, probably also uh, due to increased awareness. Um, and as you're probably also uh, aware, uh, uh, arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy predisposes to uh, ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. And particularly, uh, this uh, can occur in uh, young individuals, as you can appreciate from the uh, figure you see uh, uh, below, in which the significant portion of uh, uh, sudden cardiac death occurs in the uh, individuals uh, aged 11 uh, to 20 years old. And the, um, the reason uh, or the, the um, origin of the timing of disease onset uh, still remains elucidated. And I will come back to that shortly. So we all, uh, as uh, physicians, have a, um, a clinical dilemma in ARVC. Um, since um, the uh, exact a risk assessment for the individual patient uh, re remains a challenge. Uh, the disease has an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance pattern um, and uh, diagnosis is uh, hampered by incomplete penetrance and variable expression. Um, and even in patients with known familial or genetic risk, uh, early diagnosis and risk stratification therefore uh, can be very difficult. Um, so we would like to know who develops disease uh, and who will experience uh, life-threatening arrhythmias. Um, and this problem uh, is even mo more apparent in uh, pediatric ARVC, uh, since knowledge on pediatric ARVC is uh, uh, limited. And therefore, uh, the, the answer to the question when to intervene and how, uh, and determining safe but not too frequent follow-up uh, still remains uh, um, a question. So to start off with a case, um, uh, in our clinic, there was a 15 year old girl uh, who experienced a syncope while she was rushing to school. Um, she woke up lying on the ground next to her bike. Uh, she did not feel it coming, uh, um, had no symptoms uh, prior uh, and she was alone. So she didn't know how long uh, the syncope lasted. Uh, 
um, she felt fine afterwards um, and she resumed her way to school and uh, experienced a similar episode uh, several minutes later. So, of course, uh, um, when she told this at home, um, uh, there was a fast track to the clinical assessment uh, since her father and her aunt uh, were already diagnosed with the ARVC, as you can see in the uh, pedigree uh, uh, here. Um, and uh, she also had an uncle which died at uh, uh, 37 years old, uh, where there was no uh, autopsy performed. Um, and we all uh, already knew that the ARVC in this family was caused by a, a PKP2 mutation. Uh, and you, as you can see here, uh, the 14 year old girl was uh, uh, one of four in her, uh, uh, one of four siblings. So uh, upon clinical uh, evaluation, uh, this was the uh, ECG, um, uh, which shows uh, no um, uh, diagnostic task force criteria for ARVC. Um, she has a negative T wave in V1, uh, but that doesn't extend any further. Uh, but what is remarkable is that she has several uh, ventricular uh, extrasystoles, as you can see uh, here. Um, um, and uh, they uh, have a superior axis when you look at the uh, ECG, uh, but that's all we can say for now. Um, and uh, this beat might look suspicious for ARVC with the negative T waves uh, if you want to V3, but that's uh, probably a fusion beat uh, with a ventricular extrasystole. So um, not indica indicative of, uh, of the disease. And if you look at the uh, movie that's uh, running, that's uh, um, uh, the echocardiogram we made upon uh, first uh, clinical evaluation. Um, and uh, as you can see, the images are yeah, reasonable uh, quality, um, but the RV doesn't appear very dilated and uh, regional wall motion abnormalities are very difficult to uh, assess. Uh, but the uh, uh, left ventricular systolic function seems normal. Um, we also performed Holter monitoring, uh, and there we found that she has a uh, um, significantly, significantly increased uh, ventricular extrasystole count uh, of uh, over 8,000 uh, per 24 hours, but no non-sustained ventricular tachycardias. Um, she was also uh, um, put on a bike for the exercise uh, testing, and there we found that the uh, ventricular exosystoles were suppressed by exercise and were both uh, LBBB or, uh, and RBBB uh, uh, morphology. But once again, no uh, non-sustained ventricular uh, tachycardia. And as we were very... Um, uh, worried uh, about the uh, syncope uh, as uh, she presented. We also performed an electrophysiological study, uh, but there are no, no late potentials or uh, areas with low voltages were found. Um, and with a programmed electrical stimulation, no ventricular arrhythmia could be uh, induced. Um, uh, so we left it at at that at that point and um, also performed uh, of course the genetic testing which revealed that she was a carrier of the uh, familial pkp2 mutation so um uh, when we look at what we have uh, uh, as per um, uh, task force criteria for arvc up until now um, uh, we have um, no uh, task force criteria points uh, based on the ecg um, a minor task force criteria points based on the uh, Holter monitoring. Um, uh, no imaging task force criteria points uh, and no points uh, derived from the uh, electrophysiological study. Um, and of course, one major uh, task force criteria point for the uh, family history and uh, uh, the fact that she carried the pathogenic um, PKP2 mutation. So that makes a clinical suspicion, a borderline ARVC diagnosis, uh, but not a diagnosis that we can make uh, with certainty. Um, so uh, after extensive discussion, of course, we decided to give her uh, uh, an, uh, not yet an ICD, uh, but a very strict uh, exercise restriction. 
Um, and uh, within a short period of time, she uh, developed an overt, overt um, ARVC phenotype uh, with abnormal uh, ECG findings with a T-wave inversion in V1 and V2 and um, a minor criterion on the uh, uh, CMR, um, of which you can see the uh, images uh, below which is moving very slowly, but then you can appreciate the uh, dyskinesia even better. Um, she was started on Sotolol and uh, uh, afterwards we uh, uh, implanted an, uh, an ICD. And remarkably enough, um, she had uh, some runs of non-sustained VT, but not um, uh, no uh, ICD therapy up until now. And from 14 years of age, uh, she's now well in her 30s and had two un uncomplicated pregnancies and continues to do well. So... Um, if we look at the uh, methods of how we're doing it now, diagnosing ARVC, we're using the um, uh, 2010 uh, task force criteria, which is a set of diagnostic criteria um, uh, of which you need um, uh, task force criteria points from different categories. So there's no one gold standard. You need to have several um, uh, category abnormalities to fulfill diagnosis. And you can make a definite diagnosis if you have four points um, and uh, a borderline diagnosis with three points, as uh, was uh, the case in our patient, and two points for a possible uh, arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy or for uh, ARVC diagnosis. So if we look at the challenges uh, there are with the use of the uh, task force criteria in uh, uh, children, um, we know that the 2010 uh, task force criteria uh, uh, were derived using uh, 108 probands with a mean age of 38 years um, and only nine of them, 8% were children. Um, uh, and on top of that, uh, ARVC is a very uh, rare disease, so uh, uh, it's always important to uh, uh, keep alternative diagnosis in mind. Um, and there are also specific challenges uh, in the pediatric uh, uh, population, since the um, uh, uh, repolarization criteria of negative T waves in precordial leads um, uh, exclude children under 14 years of age. Um, and that is because there's some evidence that um, uh, negative T waves in the procordial, in the right procordial leads occur uh, relatively often in children uh, under the age of 14, um, uh, of which you can see the predictors in the table three uh, below. So uh, an age below 14, um, an incomplete uh, uh, pubertal uh, development and a very low BMI um, often results in negative T waves uh, in the right procordial leads. And with regard to the imaging uh, criteria, um, uh, children have a physiologically uh, larger right ventricle. Um, and we know that there is a decrease in, in diastolic volume of the right ventricle of approximately 5% per decade. Um, uh, so uh, that means that children are, um, um, are more prone to fulfill the imaging criteria when you don't correct for that. So it's important to keep uh, reference uh, values for uh, specific for children uh, in mind. So how do the task force criteria uh, uh, perform in pediatric cohorts? Um, uh, here, I would like to focus on two uh, studies uh, that nicely uh, outline the phenotypic uh, um, outcomes of uh, ARVC in, uh, in children. Uh, the first is a Canadian cohort of uh, 142 uh, pediatric patients that had a CMR um, using an indexed uh, right ventricular and diastolic volume. Um, and in that cohort, 16% fulfilled the criteria for a definite diagnosis, 23% uh, had a borderline diagnosis, 26 a possible uh, diagnosis, and 35% did not fulfill the diagnosis at all. Um, of the definite ARVC patients, the mean age was uh, nearly 12 years old, and 47%... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, 70, <laughs> 74% uh, 
uh, were male. Um, and in this cohort, the fulfillment of the uh, repolarization uh, criteria was relatively rare. Um, but the uh, fulfillment of CMR or imaging criteria was re relatively frequent, with nearly half of these uh, uh, definite diagnoses uh, relying on CMR for diagnosis. And which was also a very remarkable finding was that the uh, fatty infiltration or fibrosis was relatively rare uh, in this uh, population. Um, uh, diagnosis was uh, those mainly uh, based on the increase in volume and the uh, reg uh, regional wall motion abnormalities. Um, and only four children had uh, fibro fatty uh, infiltration. Uh, and these were all children that had uh, the definite diagnosis. The second study is a uh, study in a uh, Dutch and a US cohort of uh, 502 definite uh, uh, ARVC pediatric patients um, with a similar 15% uh, fulfilling uh, definite diagnosis, um, uh, but um, with a slightly older age, uh, with a median age of 15, uh, uh, and 55% uh, was male. And in this study, we also looked at phenotypic differences in uh, the pediatric versus the adult uh, population. And we found that the mode of presentation um, uh, was different. So uh, children um, more frequently present with sudden cardiac death or resuscitated uh, sudden cardiac arrest, as you can appreciate uh, below. Whereas um, uh, the adult, adult population more frequently presents with a uh, sustained uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, but if we uh, look at the um, uh, frequency and distribution of uh, task force criteria, we find that we found that um, uh, that was rather similar. So the mode of presentation seems different, but the phenotype after diagnosis or after presentation uh, seems similar between pediatric and uh, uh, adult cases. Um, and uh, if we look at the um, uh, clinical course uh, during a follow-up of uh, around eight years, uh, uh, of around eight years, we found that they had a similar uh, clinical course and outcome uh, with regard to ventricular arrhythmias, uh, cardiac transplantation or cardiac death. And um, uh, with this table, I would like to um, illustrate that uh, the phenotype between adult and uh, pediatric cases is similar. Um, if we look at the um, specific uh, task force criteria uh, categories, uh, such as the repolarization criteria, depolarization criteria, arrhythmia, arrhythmia criteria, uh, and the imaging criteria, you see that the numbers um, that have that uh, specific task force criteria um, are um, yeah, nearly the same in uh, pediatric and uh, adult cases. So the mode of presentation uh, seems to be different, but the uh, overall phenotype afterwards uh, is the same. Yeah, and this is just to... Um, yeah, uh, a hypothesis gener uh, generating uh, uh, to share with you. Uh, in a small proportion in this uh, cohort, um, we were able to evaluate also the uh, participation in uh, exercise, since we know that that can be a trigger for uh, development of the phenotype if you're having a predisposition. Um, uh, and we found that uh, in this small group, um, uh, the children that had or the pediatric ARVC cases uh, both did uh, more and higher intensity uh, exercise. So that could play a role in, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's just uh, one of the factors that can play a role in the development of pediatric ARVC. So, um, we're having challenging uh, challenges with uh, uh, diagnosing children. Um, how do we do with uh, risk assessment in children? Uh, since a few years, we have a, a nice uh, ACM risk calculator, um, uh, uh, risk stratifying um, uh, patients uh, after diagnosis. 
um, but also in uh, the cohort that uh, was used for the development of this model, uh, only a few children were included. Um, and um, as I said, this risk calculator uh, can be used after diagnosis. And we just uh, uh, saw that diagnosing children is uh, challenging. Um, uh, and also um, uh, one of the uh, uh, cautions that's mentioned in the um, in the risk assess or in the risk calculator is that yeah, a pediatric patients below the age of fourteen, um, yeah, it, it should be uh, 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 the, the results should be uh, interpreted with caution. So the risk calculator is not really um, uh, fitted for children at the moment. I think future studies should, should focus on that. Um, and that brings me to the next part of the uh, uh, presentation, the screening uh, of the uh, pediatric population. Um, so how do we um, individualize that and how we, do we do a, uh, a proper uh, risk assessment? Um, uh, I use this figure uh, from the study um, uh, to uh, explain. Um, uh, in this uh, study, there was a population of uh, 12 pediatric probands and uh, 68 at-risk uh, relatives uh, um, under the age of 18. Um, and in this population, we found that factors that are associated with adverse outcome, such as uh, sustained VT, um, uh, were a rather uh, uh, what you would expect, but uh, there were uh, negative T waves in uh, the right procordial leads, um, uh, increased uh, PVC count on halter monitoring, the presence of non-sustained VT, or, or a reduced uh, ejection fraction of the right or left uh, ventricle. So uh, these uh, uh, individual um, assessments can be used as, a, um, uh, as predictors of outcome. Um, and during follow-up um, in this study, uh, uh, 12 relatives of these 68, 18% also developed a definite uh, ARVC diagnosis. Uh, and it, in this population, we found that the uh, electrical abnormalities precede the uh, structural abnormalities, um, as you can see in the uh, figure uh, here on the right, um, with ECG changes being present in 25%, uh, uh, halter abnormalities in 20%, and imaging abnormalities in 24 and mostly being uh, CMR abnormalities. And also we found that uh, adverse outcome um, uh, merely uh, occurred in uh, uh, the patients with the definite uh, diagnosis. Um, and for the last part, I would like to uh, take you through our uh, last um, uh, or our recent, uh, recently published uh, study on individualized family screening in ARVC. Um, it's not really meant for the pediatric uh, population since uh, uh, children under the age of 14 were excluded. Um, but in this study, we tried to identify predictors and uh, the probability of development of ARVC. Um, uh, and the population consisted of uh, 136 at-risk relatives with uh, a median age of 25, um, uh, of which 45% were male. Um, and if you look at the, in the table here below, you see that there was a significant proportion of uh, uh, patients uh, below the age of uh, 20. The follow-up uh, also in this study was a median of eight years. Um, and at baseline, 68% uh, uh, or nearly uh, more than uh, two thirds had a possible ARVC diagnosis, meaning a genetic or a, fam a familial uh, predisposition. And 32, so one third, um, had a borderline ARVC diagnosis. So genetic or familial predisposition plus one minor uh, task force criterion. And uh, in this population here again, we looked at uh, predictors of uh, outcome. Uh, and if we look at um, predictors for the development of new of a new task force criterion, 
we found that um, uh, being uh, uh, at the age of 20 uh, to, to 30 years old uh, was a um, significant risk factor, um, uh, as also was um, uh, being a sibling of the proband um, and or uh, being symptomatic. Uh, and that uh, uh, holds true for development of a new task force criterion but also for development of a, a definite uh, ARVC diagnosis, so progression of disease. Um, uh, here, uh, I would like to show you that um, uh, uh, the development, uh, uh, the, the survival curves of uh, the development of a new task force criterion or um, a definite uh, ARVC diagnosis in uh, at-risk family members with possible or borderline uh, um, uh, ARVC diagnosis. Uh, and as you can see that uh, uh, in this uh, left curves, the time to a task force, uh, to development of a new task force criterion was similar. Uh, that was a median of uh, four years. Um, and yeah, that suggests that there is a comparable rate of uh, dis disease progression, uh, regardless of your uh, baseline clinical phenotype. And um, uh, if you look at the development of definite ARVC, uh, you see that uh, uh, relatives with uh, a borderline ARVC uh, progressed more rapidly to definite ARVC diagnosis, which seems logical since you're already uh, having more task force criteria. I'm nearly uh, at the end of my presentation. <laughs> um, so we translated that to um, uh, a uh, to recommendations uh, on uh, family screening uh, on an individual basis uh, uh, in ARVC. Um, so who sh should you screen? Uh, all relatives at risk, um, and uh, be aware if uh, a patient is symptomatic or uh, between the age of uh, twenty to 30 years old. Um, uh, when should you screen? Well, possible ARVC progresses, uh, the disease progresses slowly. So if you have a possible ARVC, um, you have more time, you can have a larger interval in screening. If you have a borderline ARVC, you should see, we think you should screen them yearly or uh, make a shared decision uh, on uh, when to screen. Um, and um, we think that um, ECG and Holter monitoring are um, uh, a prerequisite um, since uh, electrical abnormalities precede structural abnormalities uh, and imaging uh, should also be uh, performed at uh, regular intervals. Uh, so if you have a possible ARVC diagnosis, you can uh, start with the uh, screening of the ECG and the Holter monitoring and perform uh, imaging, uh, for instance, Every four, uh, uh, every five years, uh, and I think the um, preference goes to an, a performing a CMR. Um, uh, but if you have a borderline ARVC diagnosis, we think that you should uh, combine uh, the electrical and structural screening um, and perform it yearly or um, uh, uh, once every two years if uh, if everything uh, remains stable. So to conclude uh, this part of the webinar, um, ARVC is an important cause of uh, sudden cardiac death among uh, young individuals. Um, uh, beware of the challenging uh, in the diagnosis of uh, uh, children. Um, the incomplete penetrance and variable um, expression complicate family screening. Um, uh, but also here focus on the symptomatic siblings uh, since they are at uh, most risk. Um, uh, and keep the exercise uh, participation uh, in mind. And if you uh, uh, for, for individual uh, family screening, we uh, recommend to do um, screening based on the baseline clinical phenotype. So whether you have a borderline or possible ARVC, um, uh, if you have symptoms or uh, uh, if you're uh, between the age of 20 to 30, uh, you should screen uh, more often. Um, uh, and um, yeah, as I said before, electrical abnormalities seem to precede the structural abnormalities. <laughs>
thank you very much for your attention and um i don't know if we have time for questions or we do it in the end maybe we do it at the end in, indeed time flies right. already yeah uh, thank you Judith, <laughs> thank for a you. very clear overview and uh, i think we should continue with the presentation of dr dominic abrams from the boston children's hospital welcome to you as well of course and uh, uh yes you can take the floor please stop sharing Dominic, you're still muted. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. My apologies. So thank you very much for the very kind invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Really enjoyed Judith's conversation. And then um, I'm going to expand on what you've just heard and sort of really talk more about the phenotype and the outcomes of pediatric ARBC and to think about um, the highly varied expressivity we see in young patients. And I think that's always true of any genetic disorder in the younger population. You're going to see a very sort of different um, expressivity in many ways to the adults. But of course, there's a lot of similarity as well. Just to flag my disclosures, I'm a consultant for Rocket Pharmaceuticals who are involved in this condition. So just to sort of think about the definitions, obviously, we now think of the phenotype of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy more broadly of sort of the classical right form of the condition, biventricular and the left dominant. So I'm gonna speak very much about arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. This is the classic form of the disease um, where the right ventricular changes predominate. And we see that reflected in the ECG changes in leads V1 to V3, right ventricular VT, and then as time goes on, right ventricular dysfunction and dilatation. And of course, as we know, this can progress uh, in certain individuals to become more biventricular in its involvement. But what I'm not going to discuss today is the left ventricular form of the disease, which we're sort of increasingly understanding is phenotypically very different. So this was the sort of form that was first described. This is a paper from the Paris group, I think back in the 1980s, uh, this concept of right ventricular dysplasia before it was understood that this was a genetic etiology of a cardiomyopathy but showed all the classic features here on an old um, right ventricular gram and the ECG changes, and were subsequently related uh, initially in the desmosome to the protein uh, pla PK pla pla placophilin 2 uh, and the gene PKP2, which is by far the most common genetic etiology of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So that's very much what I'm going to focus on uh, today. And as you can see here from this sort of mock up of a cardiomyocyte, um, the desmosome is up at the top left, and placophilin 2 is one of the um, uh, components of the desmosome. And as I said, it's the most key component when we think about the etiology of ARVC, uh, representing usually about 45% of all comers and about 67% of those with a genetic etiology. So I think just two important points to raise at the beginning in terms of thinking about uh, the diagnosis of ARVC. On the left is a study that we conducted with the UK Biobank, which found that the prevalence of, PAC of PKB2 truncating variants is about one in a thousand. So these are not desperately uncommon. Um, titium we think of as much more common, maybe about one in a hundred, but PKP2 is one in a thousand. So they're all out there. But interestingly, the vast majority of these, certainly when you look at the population, do not seem to lead to a diagnosis of ARVC, the odds ratio was only 5%. But interestingly, and this is a much older population age between 40 and 70, the odds ratio of atrial fibrillation was much higher at two, uh, which we'll come back to a little bit later in the talk. But also what's important is that all the variants that we see associated with ARVC and the common ones are also the ones that are common in the population. As you can see this one in red down here, the 2146 splice variant, is by far the most common in both ARVC and in seemingly minimally or unaffected individuals. And that's no great surprise when we look at the study on the right. Um, again, another Dutch US collaboration, and when they show that the vast majority of these variants are founders. So they probably go back many hundreds of years. And so these are recurrent uh, in the population. And it's interesting why some individuals seem to develop the condition, but as it seems now, Many people do not, and that's, of course, a very interesting question as to why that may be. 
So when we're thinking about the expressivity and the and the phenotype of the condition, I think it's always important to remember that the A comes first. So this is very much in the younger patient and arrhythmogenic disorder. Here's two examples. There's a 13 year old female on the left. She has a well-known placophyllin 2 splice fam, truncating variant inherited from her mother. And you can see at the age of 13, her ECG is relatively unremarkable. She has, you could argue, abnormal T waves in V2 and V3, but she's under 14. So it's difficult to interpret those uh, with any robust conclusions. But what you can see at the bottom is that the evolution of her disease really is driven by ventricular ectopy detected on the halter. So in 2021, she had just over 300. Two years later, she had 2,000 PVCs, which evolve from sort of just single isolated beats into couplets and then couplets and triplets. So you could argue that in 2021, although she doesn't fulfill any task force criteria apart from being at risk by virtue of her genetic status, those 323 BPBs may be the early emergence of the disease that we're beginning to see. And on the right, a slightly older patient, she's a proband, not a family member, which we think of as somewhat different. Uh, she's 15, you can see clear T wave inversion from V1 to V3, and this complex ventricular ectopy with a sort of a bidirectional couplet there and very different morphologies. And so, interestingly, even at this stage with quite a complex uh, uh, halter and very abnormal ECG, her MRI re remains normal. So we're very much echoing what Judith said, that it's really the electrical changes that we see first before we detect any structural abnormalities on either echo or MRI. So in early patients, this is very much a disorder of arrhythmias. And two studies many years apart came to sort of very interestingly and similar conclusions that in young patients, the arrhythmic risk related to sudden death and car car cardiac arrest seems very much higher. Um, at the top left, there was a study from Italy which showed that patients with young patients with ARVC are at higher risk of life-threatening arrhythmias, and that was reinforced by Annalene Tehrila's paper some years later, which Judith already alluded to, that the risk of sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest is much higher. The reasons behind that have never been definitively shown, but the way we always think about it here is that in young patients with relatively healthy myocardium, you've got the, the, the potential for much more rapid transmission of a ventricular arrhythmia. And if you look on the right, this is a patient I looked after in London. Uh, I met him in 2009 when he was much older, but he presented in the mid 80s with fairly rapid VT. And you can see from the 12 lead ECG on the right, a relatively unimpaired ECG. And by the time he was 54, his v v v VT was much slower and more stable. And he now has all the classic changes in the anterior precordial leads that we associate with the disease. So a very sort of nice illustration of the evolution of the speed that VT can conduct as patients get older. And of course, he was 30 when this uh, started, not in his teens. And again, two examples on the left, again, of this very rapid, um, at the top, monomorphic and at the bottom, slightly polymorphic VT in younger individuals. Um, the top patient presented with recurrent syncope, all his other uh, investigations were completely normal. Um, and this sort of raises the potential for this concept of the concealed etiology of the disease, this early phase when all we really see is these very rapid arrhythmias before the onset of any of the classical ECG or structural changes that we associate with the disease as it gets more uh, advanced. Um, he really had nothing else to find and has not developed anything really since. Interestingly, he's got a PKP2 missense variant, which has been identified before but I think there has to be some sort of question mark over that. The younger patient had a more um, obvious ECG appearance, but again, you can see this very, very rapid VT. And not surprisingly, when you have et uh, an, an, ary an arrhythmic etiology in isolation, this can be misdiagnosed, particularly given the association that we sometimes see with exercise on the stress test. And therefore this has been misdiagnosed as CPVT. And you can see this study on the right uh, from Mike Ackerman's group at the Mayo of patients who were considered to have CPVT, but ultimately were diagnosed of ha as, as having ARVC. And many of them went on to develop more overt features of the disease as they got older. So this is sort of very important early arrhythmic phase of the disorder, and very much in the majority of individuals you're dealing with arrhythmia as the main manifestation of the disease. But that raises the question as to what drives this arrhythmia in the absence of structural changes in the right ventricle, 
it's much easier to explain in older patients when we have areas of scar tissue that form sort of set um form the, the central obstacle to conduction in bt circuits but in younger patients the this concept of inflammation has been raised and it's sort of becoming increasingly studied it's a seems to be an in, innate cellular inflammation um, this is a girl who again presented at the age of 14 with sustained vt you can see at the top and evidence clearly on her mri of delayed enhancement interestingly more in the left ventricle but probably in the right or that's more difficult to um, ascertain on those views but we very much associate this more with dsp and the left-sided form of the disease but you do see it more rarely uh, in placophilin 2 and arvc but just important not to exclude it when you have these patients with recurrent inflammation this might be right ventricular disease as well and you can see from her ecg on the right here she's got t-wave inversion but that at the time was discounted it was well she's 14 that's probably okay but she clearly was at this point evolving uh, arvc and interestingly her troponin which peaked at 2.14 so very significantly above the upper limit of normal was quite delayed after the onset of her, her vt suggesting a process of ongoing inflammation and the vt occurred very much at the start of that but what's uh, i think important to point out is that patients who suffer a cardiac arrest or who who do or don't survive that episode it seems that the majority do have an evident phenotype. On the left is a young boy who's the youngest patient we've seen with this condition. He presented at the age of 10 with a cardiac arrest and really had full-blown overt evidence of ARVC, both on his ECG, although again, you have to uh, interpret the anterior precordial leads with some caution. Uh, but if you look at this very sort of limited R-wave progression, the T-wave inversion extends more than you would expect to see in someone of his age. He had two variants, a very well-known one in placophilin 2 and a less well-known one in DSC2. And it seems to be the PKB2 one that's driving the disease in the family. But interestingly, his mother, who is minimally affected, and his uncle, who is unaffected, uh, both much later in life, also um, have the same two variants identified. And this girl on the right, who sadly didn't survive a cardiac arrest, you can see the classic pathological and histological features of the disease. Uh, the transillumination sign suggesting that the right ventricular wall is very thinned. And then on histology, transmural fibrofatty infiltration of the right ventricular myocardium. So sort of very classic feature of the disease. So patients who do seem to die suddenly do have overt findings at autopsy. And again, the paper from Annaline Tayrila some uh, nine years ago showed that in seven cases who died suddenly with autopsy performed, there was structural disease in, in six, sorry, not seven and inflammatory changes of one, again, enforcing the importance of inflammation in this disorder as well. Heart failure is also a recognized feature. It's thought of as much more as an end stage phenomenon where the disease has burnt out. But on the left here, this is a patient who presented at uh, the age of 15. As you can see, he's got advanced biventricular disease as a thrombus in the apex of the left ventricle. And he progressed rapidly. He went on to a ventricular assist device and was transplanted shortly thereafter. And again, you can see from the histology and the pathology, very advanced disease. He was found to have a single placophilin 2 splice variant. Um, we would classically associate that with ARVC, but it was unusual to see such a severe form of heart failure in someone with this ge genetic predisposition. But he was there. We assumed he was the proband, and therefore this may um explain why he presented with such a severe form of the condition so young but interestingly i met his sister recently she's on the right here she's now in her 30s she's got as you can see a fairly classic ecg uh, had had an icd implanted elsewhere and was having runs of, of vt terminated by atp uh, but it turns out that she actually presented relatively young in life and so she in this family is the proband and this young man in fact is a family member so as judith said siblings seem to be at higher risk but also the expressivity can be highly varied in families and important to understand and to acknowledge that family members can also present at a young age with severe disease. The expressivity again can be very um, varied. This is, a, I think, a very unusual case, but one important just to raise. This is a young girl I met at the age of six. Uh, she had two placophilin variants, a, um, a frame shift variant, and then a well-known uh, missense variant, which is probably acts as a modifier in this situation. 
that she first came to medical attention when she presented with severe neonatal left ventricular failure or ventricular failure and required five days of ECMO. And it was noted as she recovered, she had this hypertrabeculated pattern that you can see here on her echo uh, and on the MRI on the right. She had a sort of a gradual improvement in ventricular function over time, but interestingly, her brother in the, in the interim presented with VT at the age of seven and very sadly died um, on a VAD after that. Um, importantly, both parents were completely asymptomatic. We always associate, or traditionally we've associated this inflammation as a very early part of the condition, the sort of triggering, if you like, of the disease evolution. But she, when she had quite advanced biventricular dysfunction at the age of eight, also presented with episodes of inflammation and then was transplanted at the age of nine. So I think importantly in her case, inflammation can occur at any stage of the condition. And also this pattern of hypertrabeculation can be seen with placophilin 2 mediated ARVC as it can with many other things. So don't always think that this is purely a hypertrabeculated uh, LV. It can be associated with right ventricular changes as well. And we know some sort of past mouse studies that placophilin 2 can be very sort of importantly implicated in uh, morphogenesis of the heart, which may explain this pattern of hypertrabeculation in the patient with biallelic uh, risk factors. And it getting even uh, less common, I think it's fair to say, this is a girl who is homozygous for a placophilin 2 truncating frame shift variant, or a placophilin 2 frame shift variant. Um, I believe she's the only one who survived in animal models. It's neonatal lethal. Um, she uh, presented with an aortic coarctation and VSD, which is nothing particularly surprising in the congenital heart disease world, but had this very prolonged and unexpected post-op course after a relatively straightforward re repair and also had a family history of congenital heart disease as well. She was transferred up to us uh, in Boston at the age of just short of her fourth birthday. And I'm sorry, this ECG is pretty poor quality. This, in fact, shows atrial fibrillation, which is exceedingly uncommon um, in, in a three-year-old. Um, and you can see, again, she's got severe biventricular dysfunction, biatrial dilatation. Uh, on her echo, the right ventricle is very wide, as uh, is very dilated as well. And you can see a broad QRS. And she was ultimately transplanted um, after receiving a bivad just shy of her fifth birthday. This is again, we've been reported in other individuals, in this case with hyperplastic left heart syndrome. As I said, all these patients do not seem to survive. I think this is the only girl who has. But it's very interesting that placophilin 2 in, in biallelic forms can be implicated in congenital heart disease, but we do not see that in heterozygotes. So this is an extremely rare um, form of expression of the disease, but one again, just to be aware of. You've already seen the image on the right, uh, but these two studies really nicely document some of the outcomes that I've spoken about. But just to sort of summarize in patients who present at a young age with a genetic disease, you're often gonna see more severe forms of the condition. They're gonna be somewhat outliers compared to the traditional forms that we experience in adult patients. And both studies show this sort of important, aggressive progression in young patients with arrhythmia dominating, but also patients who develop heart failure at a relatively young age, and as I showed from that 15 year old, this isn't necessarily always in probands. The reasons for that remain very unclear. And of course, we're making an assumption that the placophilin 2 variant involved is the only etiology, but it may well be that there are other things in those patients which drive a severe and early onset of the phenotype. So just to conclude, I think the diagnosis of ARVC in young patients is increasingly recognized, which has led to more cases being described, which is great. When we think about the condition, um, it's not that uncommon. The, the prevalence of PKB2 truncating variants, which can cause ARVC, is one in a thousand. And these are very rarely de novo. So if you identify a child with the condition, you need to screen the family aggressively because it's highly likely that one of the parents will have it. Um, and of course, we're increasingly now recognizing this in probands who present in childhood, but often with somewhat varied expression of the disease and don't always conform to the classical uh, phenotype that we see in adults. It's still a disease of arrhythmias primarily in the young, but these other expressions of inflammation, sudden death, heart failure, and congenital heart disease are recognized. And really, when you're screening patients who are genetically at risk, very important to use ECG and Holter first, because if those are abnormal, if those are not um, abnormal, then you're highly, highly unlikely to see anything on the echo or MRI. 
And so we really use the halter uh, in at-risk individuals as the primary screening tool. One group I haven't mentioned, but are incoming increasingly recognised, it's going to be interesting as to how we deal with these patients as secondary findings. Uh, we've got a number of PKP2 families where this has been detected, uh, where genetic testing was performed for non-cardiac reasons. So that's something that we're going to have to sort of address as we go forward and how we manage these patients is going to be interesting. And I think sort of in many ways, you could say that these patients are a real unique opportunity to sort of understand the genetically at-risk population more broadly, because of course, historically, we've been very driven by the patients that we ascertain through medical conditions and not those who are out there in the populations. This is going to help us better define the wider phenotype and outcomes of those who are genetically at risk. I'm able to work with a fantastic team just to acknowledge all of them uh, who've been very important in all the work we do. And once again, thank you very much for the incredibly kind invitation. It was a pleasure uh, to be part of this today. So thank you. Thank you, Dominic, uh, for this very nice uh, and, and also impressive uh, cases you shared with us. Uh, I think we had two questions in the chat. Maybe we can go to that. Um, you did. Can you help us with that? Um, yeah, there's you see the uh, questions from Marta Catona. Yeah. Um, um, just stating, stating that I'm an adult cardiologist, so probably Dominic uh, is the best uh, expert to uh, to ask. Answer the question. The, the question is: There is a, a positive family history of ARVC. Father has been resuscitated and lives in an ICD. The cardiac uh, MRI uh, is normal in the case of a six-year-old daughter. Would you repeat the MRI in some years later in her case? Um, uh, yes, I uh, would uh, definitely do that. And I think if she just has a possible uh, ARVC, um, then you could uh, um, uh, hold on to an interval of five years, uh, for example. But I'm not sure what Dominic thinks. <laughs> you know, I would agree. I think, but I, I think as I would really, we find the halter is probably the most helpful thing to see the first emergence of the condition. She's obviously at risk by virtue of the family history, but if you can prove this is PKP2 as well, then even more um, important. And then you probably that's the first thing that you're going to see changing. Obviously, it's much more difficult to do an MRI in someone this age. So that's what I would really be focusing on. But as Judith said, you're going to want to repeat the imaging. Um, but probably you can wait for some years before you do that again. Thank you. And then we have a question from Ruth Biller. She is our patient representative um, in the AOPC group. And uh, she asks about the advice for sports and, and maybe also restrictions in sports. Uh, Dominic, can you tell us something about that? What would you advise? Um, so we have very honest discussions with all the families, um, explaining the association between particularly plaque of villain two and exercise. Um, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that there are many patients out there, as I alluded to, with plaque of villain two truncating variants who don't seem to have the condition. Um, and you see, we've seen significant discordance in families as well, um, whereby the pro bands was not particularly athletic. Older siblings were and now in their 40s and still have no feature of the condition. So I think it's very much at this stage a joint decision making process. Some people will say, thank you very much. We're going to you know, not participate in sports. That's the information we wanted to hear. Others, it's more important they do participate in sports. So we do allow people to do so if they're genetically at risk or have a family history. Uh, but obviously, we monitor them very carefully. And I think it's important to sort of set the the boundaries or set an understanding going forward that we may change decision making based on if the condition starts to evolve um, in any one individual so that's how we tend to play things but we do let people continue if they're just ge ge genetically predisposed but then we would obviously change that depending on emergence of the phenotype and particularly people who as judith kate um nicely demonstrated they present with symptoms during exercise then it becomes a very different discussion that's how we would approach the purely asymptomatic individual great thank you um well i don't see any other questions um so and it's already almost uh, five to two uh, um so i would like to thank you thank you uh in the first place to our speakers of course of today and also to everyone who participated
Um, we hope to meet you next month again for the April's webinar. And uh, just to remind you, we just discussed at the board meeting last week that then the, we will start with um, uh, webinars at five in the afternoon. Um, and hopefully that's an easier time slot for everyone to participate. Oh, I see you, uh, Ruth um, raised her hand. Uh, uh, yes, I have another question um, regarding the MRI because you showed um, that in the pediatric population um, there was not such um, a big amount of fibro fatty um, replacement. So um, could you do MRI without um, contrast agent in pediatrics? Or would you advise to do a normal with gadolinium? Is there late gadolinium enhancement in, in pediatric population? Or could you do it without it? Um, so we certainly do use uh, contrast in pretty much everyone. We have done studies without in very young patients where IV access was a problem. Um, obviously, you can look at the gross anatomy of the right ventricle and you can measure the volumes and see changes. But I do think it's important to look for subtle areas, which may not be scar, but maybe inflammation. Uh, which can be helpful in understanding the diagnosis as well. We very rarely do MRIs before the age of 12, unless there's a very compelling reason. Um, I actually think the echo is very helpful in ARVC as well. Um, so that tends to be our strategy. So by then, most kids are very happy to have an IV, or not happy to have an IV, but it's not a problem. Um, so then we can just do a very straightforward standard MRI. That's the way we've approached it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. See you next month in the next webinar. Bye bye.